All right, guys, so when we left off, we were talking about the Mormon church, and I told you I would finish um, kind of what was going on and uh, talk about their history, and I did find out the answer to some of your questions. Um, the uh, area of the temple uh, site, which is next to the Community of Christ Temple, where the Mormons have land, um, we don't know. There is possible plans for a temple there, but um, again, it would have to be approved. Uh, it's a, It's up to the City of Independence, so... We'll see if that ever happens. But yeah, they do own that that little section next to uh, the Community of Christ Temple, which is the one that you guys you know see when you go to graduate. Uh, the auditorium is where we always used to have the graduation until you know COVID happened. All right, so when we left off. We were talking about uh, the governor right here of Missouri issuing the extermination order, ordered the people of Missouri to force Mormons out of the state, and even you know allowed them to kill them, if you will, <laughs> if they. Uh, if they, you know, refuse to follow. So there is an exodus. People will leave Caldwell County, Davies County. Some will head north to Iowa, and we'll talk about that group here in a little bit. And then the majority of them will go to um, cross the Mississippi River and land in a village in Illinois called Commerce. Now, um, this whole area, this whole 1838 period uh, with the fighting that was going on and the extermination order has been called the Mormon War in Missouri history. Now, um, Smith is going to rename Commerce Nauvoo. It's a very small little village, but now there were thousands of Mormon settlers moving in there. And the city, uh, it went from being just a village to a pretty large city. It actually um, rivaled Chicago in terms of population in Illinois. Uh, he created the Nauvoo Legion, militia force to protect them, and became the mayor. Now, the surrounding towns, again, uh, at the beginning, kind of just tolerated the situation, but then they became suspicious. They really felt that Smith was creating his own army and that he was going to, you know, separate areas of the country and create his own empire. Um, there's no evidence of this, but the fear was there. And so in 1844, uh, Smith was arrested and charged with treason. The charge was that he was conspiring against the government to create a Mormon colony in the Southwest. Now, while he was being held, in a town nearby called Carthage, a mob attacked the prison and killed him and his brother Hiram. They tried to kill others, but they were not successful. So the founder of the church was now dead, as was his brother, and they now had a decision to make. Okay, um, The problem we had is that there was already a split forming. Um, we had a, a leader named Brigham Young, who had been one of the counselors, one of the advisors to Joseph Smith Jr. He decided that he would become uh, the leader, and some others approved it, and he wanted to leave. He decided that the best thing for the Mormons to do would be to head west, form their own community. Another group, <laughs> under Joseph Smith III, who was Joseph Smith's son, oldest son, they were not happy with the direction things were going. They wanted to stay in the area, but in this case, move to Iowa, where some of the others are gone, and they wanted to rid themselves of the more controversial uh, doctrines. For example, polygamy. They said, you know, the plural marriage is really causing issues with <laughs> all these people around us, so let's get rid of that. So um, we have a split. Um, the majority of the Mormons will follow Brigham Young, and you can see on the map here, they will leave uh, Illinois, and they will head through Iowa, Nebraska, Wyoming, and into the Salt Lake Valley of what is now Utah. And this is what the valley looked like, supposedly, when they got there. And this is what Salt Lake City will look like about 20, minute, 20 years or so after they've built it. The other group that stays in Iowa will form a new church uh, in the town of Lamoni, right across the Missouri border, under Joseph Smith III, and call themselves the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So remember, the Mormons are called the Latter-day Saints. This is the RLDS, okay? This group today renamed itself the Community of Christ, and as I told you, this is the church that I'm a part of. And um, they disavowed plural marriage and kind of formed themselves as a just a normal Protestant church, though they still use the um, Book of Mormon, and the Doctrine and Covenants, which is a um, a text that is added to. Doctrine and Covenants is added to um, whenever uh, the founder of the church uh, decides that you know things need to be added. So there's constant additions to the Doctrine and Covenants. And having gone to church now for you know 15 years since I joined it, um, we use the Doctrine and Covenants in the Bible more than we use the Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon's reference, but it's not 
used as much in Community of Christ as it used to be. Uh, the Utah group under Young will form the Utah Republic. They will call themselves Deseret. But in 1856, the U.S. Army was sent in because there was fear that Young was becoming too powerful, and they called this the Utah War. So they called in the U.S. Army to essentially reassert control over Utah. Uh, during this, we have a famous incident, still controversial today, the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And it was a group of settlers from Arkansas who uh, were traveling, and you don't see it on the map here, but they were traveling uh, west, aiming to go to California. They were traveling through Utah at a time that this Utah war was ongoing. So what they think happened is a group of a, a militia decided that these settlers were, you know, agents of the U.S. Army. They were there to spy on what was going on, and so they trapped them and they massacred them. They also used a group of Native Americans, the Ute tribe, uh, fought with them. Now, what's interesting is we don't know today how much Brigham Young knew about it. According to some historians, he authorized it. According to Mormon historians, he had no idea what was happening and would never have allowed his men to massacre innocent civilians. So big debate today. They made a movie about it a few years ago that was um, <laughs> that was protested at by um, the Mormon church. They said that it was inaccurate. But again, we don't know exactly um, who authorized it. But what we do know is that the survivors were mostly children. Um, some children were actually killed in the massacre, but most of the children survived and they were given to Mormon families as orphans. So they were raised in the Mormon church without knowing that their parents had been part of this group. So that's the other very controversial part. Utah would finally become a state in 1890 when they disavowed polygamy and said that plural marriage was no longer allowed. There are still some, you know, radical groups, some radical sects as part of uh, the Mormon church that still believe in polygamy, but they are not considered official and they've actually separated from the Mormon church because of that. All right, so besides the transcendentalists, reform was also happening in religion, and then we'll also see it with regards to alcohol, okay? So in 1820s, we have a second great awakening that starts among Protestants in the East Coast, but it will spread um, along the Ohio Valley into the Old Northwest, so Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. Um, the second great awakening is talking more about personal faith, um, stepping away from predestination. The belief is that, you know, your faith and how you see it to you is what matters more than what someone tells you. And then also moral behavior. Um, the leader, Finney, right here, Charles Grandison Finney, um, he is uh, basically a um, believer that uh, women would be important. Um, he wasn't a feminist by any means, but he did tell women that it was their job to ensure that their husbands were kept on the right track. Okay, so um, women would become the main leaders of the Second Great Awakening, and they would be more influential at his meetings than even men. Okay, now the other group or the other um, issue that was uh, part of this was temperance, um, an attempt to ban alcohol. Now we know from freshman history that um, we did eventually have prohibition in 1920 until 1933, and we know that it was a failure. But the idea of banning alcohol actually started way back in the 1830s, okay? And the problem was, is that at this time, um, Americans did spend a lot of time and money drinking alcohol. Remember, in certain areas, you did not drink the local city water, you could die. <laughs> that was a legitimate possibility. So by putting, uh, you know, drinking ale, whiskey, bourbon, okay, beer, um, that was safer because it was treated and you were not likely to get cholera or dysentery from that. However, of course, you know, it's alcohol. It causes you to, you know, have other other side effects. Um, farmers were turning their extra grain into whiskey. Bars and taverns and saloons were everywhere. In the West, there were some towns with more saloons than people. And drinking was the principal leisure activity. You know, some of these men are working 80 to 100 hours a week. So as soon as the workday was over, they were, um, you know, dealing with it by plying themselves with alcohol. And in some cases, you know, drunkenness became part of their lifestyle. Religious leaders hated it, okay, um, except for the Catholic Church. Now, the Catholic Church was not 
they were not in favor of temperance, but remember, um, wine is used as part of the sacrament, and they were concerned that by banning alcohol, it would ban uh, wine, which was used in their services, you know, for um, uh, Eucharist, for the Eucharist. So women especially uh, took the lead on temperance because they felt that First of all, their husbands were spending more time drinking than being good fathers and husbands. And then when they, you know, came home from the saloon, they were, you know, abusing their families. So in most of our major cities, the temperance groups will be set up. But again, for immigrants, they looked at the temperance people with a lot of suspicion. For immigrants from Ireland, Germany, Italy, okay, drinking is part of the cultural identity. I mean, you know, German beer, <laughs> Germany, uh, you know, drinking beer is part of German culture, and they did not understand why people would want to ban it. So some of our temperance advocates end up becoming nativists. In other words, anti-immigration. They thought that, you know, one way to further the temperance movement would be to um, stop immigrants from coming because they were the ones that were bringing alcohol in trouble. Okay, not true, but again, you can see where those two issues would become linked. And then we also see reform efforts to deal with public health conditions, especially illness. I just mentioned cholera, okay? Cholera is a bad one. <laughs> it affects the body, and I put a little diagram here for those of you who are in science class. Um, it's a bacterial infection. Uh, it typically killed more than half of its victims before antibiotics were created. You acquired it through tainted food or untreated water. It still exists today in developing countries, but, you know, in America, it's largely gone because, you know, we treat our tap water. Um, the problem at the time was that, again, uh, people didn't make the connection between cholera and being an infection. That did not occur until the 1900s. So um, they didn't understand how cholera was being passed. And once they do, then we're going to see changes with regards to public water systems. Uh, we also saw, you know, um, non-scientific theories for cures. Uh, for example, um, the water cure, what we would call today hydrotherapy. They would tell people, oh, you're, you got sick. You know, we'll put you in a bath of cold water and then we'll put you in a bath of hot water. And, you know, we, we do that today. You know, athletes do it all the time. But at that time, um, you know, they didn't really know how much it did and... Not really sure if it was actually effective. Maybe it was. Um, one of the ideas that had zero effectiveness and absolutely zero scientific value was phrenology. Okay, Phrenology was the belief that you could feel the bumps on someone's head and determine um, what they were thinking and how they were feeling and why they were ill. And you even see this little diagram that came at the time of, you know, where, <laughs> where uh, ideas came from. No scientific value at all. And then we had Sylvester Graham right here. Um, he said that if you ate fruit, vegetables, and coarse grains, your diet would be improved and your health would be good. Now, again, fruit, vegetables, and coarse grains, that all sounds good. But what his legacy is, is the graham cracker. He created the graham cracker because he thought it would be the perfect food that would have nutritional value. I love graham crackers. Not sure how nutritional they are, but, you know, I do like them. So still around today. Um, in terms of medical science, we're still seeing reform in that. Legitimate doctors had to deal with, you know, what we call quacks, people who thought themselves to be doctors, people who even tried to, you know, sell products. Um, we mentioned this in, uh, in recent American history, but uh, John Rockefeller, the famous oil man, his father was one of those people who traveled around the country selling like, you know, drink this tonic potion and your hair will grow back or, you know, drink this liquid and your cancer will be cured. Um, those people you know, hurt medical science. The quacks and those who um, had no idea <laughs> uh, what to do were the ones who were hurting people. Um, medical advance was very slow at this time. There was very little knowledge of disease. And so most of the people, most of the things that we discovered, the medical discoveries were based on country wisdom and dumb luck. That's what the book said. So for example, Edward Jenner, okay? Edward Jenner, if you know the story, he watched that whenever, you know, smallpox, um, uh, outbreaks came through town, the um, milkmaids, the local milkmaids never got it. So he uh, did some studies and found out that the milkmaids got um, what was called cowpox. K 
cowpox was a mild version, kind of like chicken pox. Uh, you'd get it, you'd itch for a few days, and then it would go away. So he decided to use that and was able to come up with a vaccine to inoculate people against smallpox. Now, as you can see here in the picture, um, it didn't go over well. Vaccine theory was new. And so um, Jenner's first test subject was um, a boy that he had to talk into doing it. And I think his son was like second. So, you know, <laughs> people wanting to take vaccines. Hmm, talk, stop me where I heard this today. You know, because they were untested, uh, you know, often have to run into, you know, some sort of a uh, a issue in terms of getting people to approve them. So yeah, when Edward Jenner created the smallpox vaccine, people weren't exactly lining up at first to take it. Yeah, I know. Sounds like COVID. All right. Anesthesia, first used by a New England dentist, William Morton. He uh, used sulfuric ether to put a patient under while he extracted teeth. And then Boston physician John Warren began using ether with his surgical patients. But again, People thought that, you know, using some sort of a chemical was bad and it would hurt the surgery. And so there was still the traditional methods, which, by the way, the traditional method of surgery was to give you a whole bunch of whiskey and a stick in your mouth as they did surgery. Not, ex not exactly medical science. And then Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, the poet and the doctor, and his son would become a famous poet as well. He surmised that diseases were being transmitted from one person to another. So a German scientist, Ignaz Simmelweis, did a study among his medical students and proved it and said, yeah, you know, if one person has it, they can transfer it to someone else. Um, education reform. Uh, up until the 1830s, no state had a universal public education system. Only Massachusetts had a very limited version. But beginning in the 1830s and continuing all the way up to the Civil War, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Connecticut, all of them will create universal public education. And in Massachusetts, uh, the guy who launched this was Horace Mann, right there. And he is still influential in education. So if you take education classes, you'll talk about Horace Mann. All right. So Mann wanted public education. He thought it would make better citizens and further democracy. In the South, we had schools, but no actual public school system, and none would be created until Reconstruction. Um, only about a third of Southern whites attended school, and no African Americans actually attended school though approximately 10% of slaves learned how to read, which was remarkable considering what happened. Uh, by 1860, 72% of Northerners were attending school, but it was, for many, especially in the rural areas, very casual and very infrequent, you know, based around harvest time and things like that. Uh, but by 1860, the Northern literacy rate was 94%. In the South, it was 58%, though it was 83% of Southern whites. Okay, and then for those who were handicapped, we're starting to see an improvement in public education, though really um, for those who were handicapped, it was designed to teach them skills, which would allow them to have a job and make money. You know, none of it was designed to get them to further their education or go to, you know, college or university or anything like that. All right, in rehabilitation reform, uh, until the early 1800s, we were putting all prisoners, either if they were criminals or mentally ill or debtors or paupers, all putting them in the same facilities that were serving as prisons. In some cases, and I heard stories about this in New Jersey, they were literally holes in the ground. They would dig holes in the ground, throw some iron bars over the top, and call that a prison. All right. But in the 1820s, we get a new model, what is called a penitentiary, and there's a picture of an early one. Um, the word comes from the word penitence, to atone for one's sins. And so in New York State in 1821, they will build the first penitentiary. This woman right here, Dorothea Dix, will push for asylums. She says that those who are mentally ill should not be in the same prison as people who committed murders and other crimes. So she really made a push to build, you know, different facilities for both. And New York will be the first to do it. And pretty soon other states will do it as well. Okay. Um, the problem is, is that now we will get overcrowding. <laughs> and, you know, once we get overcrowding, then you have the problem of can you spend money to build a new facility? And even today in 2021, when you ask people to build more money for prisons, they typically say no. Ah, prisons are fine. We need money for schools. So prisons, asylums, you know, orphanages, those don't typically get the revenue. Uh, for children, they're going to start creating orphanages to uh, allow for unwanted children to have a new home. Problem is, is that for many of these orphanages, they took money and they didn't necessarily care about the kids. 
So there were lots of cases of, you know, children being abused at these orphanages. And um, if you ever saw Annie, <laughs> you know, Annie, good example, uh, little orphan Annie. Yeah. So um, that idea continues all the way to the present day. And then almshouses and workhouses were created for those who were debtors. This is still the time where if you owed money, you could be thrown in jail. That won't end until the late 1800s. But again, you think about it, debtors' prisons made very little sense because essentially if they owe money and you throw them in jail, how are they going to make money to get out of jail? Yeah, it basically guaranteed future debt. Okay? All right, we'll continue with more on reform and then we'll get into abolitionism next. <laughs>